I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, tools for pee management, and then we're going to have a short break, get recharged with coffee, and maybe there's other things down there, and um, come back for a couple of more talks that you'll see on the program. Pete Bardis is here, uh, and, and Dennis Frame, and then there's going to be a short session, another 20 minutes for a panel discussion um, to try and um, get some uh, discussion going back and forth here. So. Um, with that, with that, I just want to talk today a little bit about um, the history of risk assessment, the tool that you know, works, a lot of us have been using for phosphorus management. How did that come about? Um, what led to the revision of the 590? How that's, gone, um, how that's occurring and what, what has been involved with that? Um, some of the use and misuse maybe of um, these tools for pea management and looking at different BMPs and how they fit into this and how these tools can be used to either identify, select BMPs and the best way forward uh, to this. So what we did um, about 15 years ago was decided that we needed to take some of this research out to farm fields uh, and do it rather than bringing the soils back to the lab. And there was a network of um, research from land grant and ARS collaborating across the country um, supported by ARS and NRCS, uh, looking at these small plots and basically what people were doing were, were raining on these at the same rate so that our data was comparable across, um, across state lines and that we could uh, hope to get a larger database that was, um, we know, we'd suffered a lot, we've done a lot of work but we all tended to be fractured and doing it our own way in our own areas uh, and so this was a a good example, I think, of, of coordination, but that, that, that each had their own focus uh, and their own uh, goals. But it did allow us to get some information. And what really we were, we were able to do was standardize some of these techniques if you're trying to get develop tools and they're based on science to give us some science to look at, to, to support that. Um, looking at how do you do these uh, tests and trying to get some consensus on the best way to get the right information to use to drive these tools. And we looked at being able to establish um, uh, a relationship between soil phosphorus and what was in the, in the runoff. Uh, we know that you know, there's more that's in the soil, there's going to be more in runoff, but taking that relationship and getting some more quantification behind it and support that when we take these tools to farmers that they um, can understand and say, oh, okay, that makes some sense to me Therefore, uh, if we're asking them to change, we need to provide the evidence that they can understand and they can, um, they're more likely to perhaps buy into that idea. Um, and then how was that integrated uh, and, and looking at, it, you know, incorporating, but rather into the more whole process of planning. Um, but it's partly it was a success in terms of these tools were developed as a group effort, uh, somewhat of a consensus, and it was somewhat flexible to uh, states. Each states had their own policy uh, goals that differed from um, one, one to another. And as you will see, that was, that was, that was a strength, but as we probably realize, it's also a weakness. Um, and so what we, we, do, what we did, um, this is some work in Pennsylvania, each of these points is, is using that rainfall simulator, and you get a good relationship. These soils didn't have any fertilizer applied for quite a while. Um, but we're looking at most of these soils, as you know, were probably based on nitrogen applications for manure, and so they were overplanted. But most of these soils were above for the crop response level. Um, but what it did show that we could split this into two separate lines and give us an idea that uh, above this split line, and you know, not everybody sees this, but generally there's a, a, an inflection point uh, where that curve starts to get a bit steeper and it kind of helps us define, okay, if you, there's a level above which uh, there is the, the potential for that phosphorus to re uh, be released and remobilized from that soil is greater than below it. Um, and I guess we, this is somewhat, you know, as a group of scientists battling around, batting around numbers, 200 was, was a number that was kind of come forward, um, but it did give us, give us some ideas. Another way that we talked about was looking at well, if you're having one PPM in point source um, requirements, then you just go across here to one PPM to see where that comes 
uh, on that sort of test speed. But it did allow, from different states, using this technology to get some more science. Um, and some work then that kind of followed on from that, that helped us in, in you know, get this idea across that there's more than just sort of phosphorus. If you look at uh, how much phosphorus is in the soil on these um, plots here, there were strip crops, so there were different fertilizer manure treatments uh, over the period of years, and uh, obviously there was more phosphorus in the top of those soils uh, than there was down at the bottom, partly because there's a, an ephemeral creek that runs here, and this area is wet, farmers probably not going to get down there um, anyway, but um, if you are basing this uh, concept of tools for phosphorus management on just soil phosphorus, you would probably say this is the worst case. Uh, this, is, this is all right, and up at the top you've got more phosphorus there, so let's be more restrictive. When um, those little gray areas are um, runoff plots, where we the, uh, the runoff, um, and this is how much phosphorus had been applied to those plots because of um, applying it with the nitrogen and those um, uh, weak alfalfa corn rotations. Um, and when you looked at how much runoff, we found that, you know, oh, there's a lot more runoff uh, coming off the, the bottom. And again, this, a lot of us understand that, but um, it gave us some um, evidence to show that um, there's some areas of the landscape have, have a greater propensity for runoff. And uh, here there was little runoff at the, at the surface because it was infiltrating. It was hitting a, a, a fragile pan that we didn't realize was there. On the other side of the hill slope, where the person is taking the picture is standing, that fragile pan isn't there, um, and you really don't get very much runoff at all. But from the surface, they look identical. Um, but when you look at the losses, if we look at you know how much is coming off, you know the risk is greater here than um, the top. So again, it's simple, but it was uh, it was the concept that. You know, we need to have this idea for tools of phosphorus management. If we're looking at managing phosphorus on a risk basis rather than an agronomic basis, we're looking at an agronomic um, tool for management. Obviously, we've got soil testing, and that's what we need to know. Um, but I think what we've learned is if we're looking for risk assessment, that we need this idea of this transport and this, uh, you have to have a mechanism put together, whether it's runoff or leaching in certain areas, but you have to have that mechanism. And, and therefore, the tools that we've then developed for the management um, really need to account for the transport as well. Now, that's, that's great from a research point of view, but as probably most of you who are researchers in here know that opens a can of worms, so to speak, and makes it more complicated. We, we as researchers like to make things a little bit more complicated, but um, <coughs> transport isn't easy to define, but we know we need to include it in these tools, but having said that, it, we need to try and consider, I guess, the regulator's point of view that these, these tools that we use <coughs> for management that get into regulated management um, need to have some black and white and some uh, confines, and so there has to be this give and take to a certain extent, but this general rule that most of the pea comes from a small portion of the watershed tends to hold around the country. That small portion could be in different places in a different watershed or a different where you are in, in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arkansas. It could be a different part of that watershed. But generally speaking, it, it tends to hold. Um, and from that, I guess, we've got this idea um, that the, there's a few states that haven't gone with using um, uh, this <coughs> phosphorus indexing approach as a risk assessment for phosphorus, for, as a tool for phosphorus management, but the majority have. And, and I'll, I'll touch on a little bit about, you know, what, 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 where are we now? But these are the different, for those of you not familiar, these are the, uh, some of the properties, but basically the index is just a USLE version of soil loss, and you just try and account for the best you can some of those processes, and obviously it's not just the best because we've done a lot of work, uh, a lot of people have put a lot of effort into defining what these processes are going to have, uh, how important runoff is in one location, erosion to the other factors, but it's basically in different areas of the country or different states, what uh, major processes capture that phosphorus uh, transport um, for, that, for them to use as a tool. And so, 
going about testing, some work has been done with testing, um, but not a lot, and I will come, come and readdress that in a, in, a, in a minute. But you go back to that, kind of, that nice slope where we don't have any. But when you do apply uh, fertilizer, either right, be it triple super, beta, uh, or, or manure, then it doesn't, they don't fall on the line. But when we change that idea from a solid phosphorus to an index, because we're accounting for the application B, whether it's timing, rate, um, st um, the method of application, where they put it, they tend to, because it, it ends into that equation, or that tool of management, that we get a better estimate of the loss of phosphorus, and this is on a loss basis. And so then the science tends to leave then, and we have this uh, social or political uh, input into it as to where these pattern curves go, and I guess we're still debating that. Um, and I think, you know, we're obviously some of the standoff that we don't want to. It's that difficult because to decide where this 100 point is and setting your boundaries depends probably on the watershed you're in and the sensitivity of that lake. Not all of them are going to be the same, and therefore uh, there is a lot of discussion as to where that. Um, where those categories should fall. But it does get lead us to this idea that there's different parts of the watershed that um, are at greater risk for loss of phosphorus than others. And so our tools of management are really focused on trying to identify with limited resources where those resources will be best put. Um, and this is just a simplistic idea that um, on the uh, outer bounds of this watershed, uh, we have a lot of inf infiltration, runoff does occur, but it never gets to the stream. Um, therefore, they're at risk and might go to another field, but that risk should be a bit lower. Um, and then we have some intermediate areas, and this brings up another issue. We have intermediate areas, and we've got to decide what that risk will allow. A lot of what we did with the simulators worked at a 10-year return period storm. Um, if we go increase that risk, say, to a 100-year storm, uh, you know, we talked to we try and explain to, to farmers what, you, you know, the logic behind uh, a hundred year storm. When we had three hundred year storms in our area last year, it doesn't really make sense. But if we try, if we look at, say, we're going to manage for that, that, that huge event that we know is going to carry 80% of our nutrients out in that one event, it takes this area of risk further and further out away from the stream. And so again, that's something else we've got to probably address and consensus on as to what risk are we trying to manage for. The small events that carry, uh, you know, we might get 10 or 20 a year, or that big gully washer, um, toad strangler, they call them in Arkansas. Um, so where did the breakdown, it's all nice, and, uh, but where did the breakdown? Because there was a lot of disparity uh, uh, across the country in indexes. And they varied with soils, topography, and that's what they should have done. Um, but they, we got a lot of criticism. We started to get criticism over the last few years that, um, you know, we were phosphorus researchers, develop our own tools, managing our own tool. It was a bit like the fox at the chicken house, or so to speak. But the basic line problem was, I think, in the Chesapeake Bay, they weren't seeing declines in soil test B, there, nor were there in some cases seeing the decline in P management or P application on soils that really shouldn't have been applying uh, phosphorus to. The index wasn't um, sensitive enough to, to, to reduce that. And so there's a perception out there that, uh, that some of these are, are farmer friendly. Um, but I guess what we're now realizing, we always knew, but uh, I guess is it takes system takes time to respond and we've got to get a better idea of what is we seeing from current management and what are we seeing in terms of losses from the past manager the last 10 years, so to speak. But I guess that one thing that we're always trying to get a point across, it's fine to criticize the index because it isn't perfect or, or that tool of management, so to speak. Uh, but it never was meant to be the solution. It was meant to be a band-aid to manage uh, phosphorus on a farm to minimize risk. It wasn't just going to be so, to solve this phosphorus problem um, per se, um, and so that's, that, that was a, um, I think we all tended to, as researchers, develop it, that we've done a good job, we go off, we do something else, and we leave it alone. But Diana Osman did a study in 2006 and repeated it basically in 2012 of the Southern US, 
and we don't really need to get into which is more restricted than the other, but the idea here is what she did was used each of the index from these different states um, and then came up with, you know, under same conditions, again, it's not going to be perfect world because those same conditions vary from state to state, but the idea, what it shows is there's a lot of variability across state lines. Um, and again, we don't need to worry about, you know, which state was which, but there were some states that never really said you ever got into a high category. There were some that were always in the high category, but there were some that never got you out of your okay with them based applications. And NRCS and EPA saw that and said, that's just not right. And it isn't right. And so that really fueled this idea for the revision. And so then we decided, okay, you need to revise it. We do have some field data, but when we start to look at getting the field information to, to, to calibrate or to assess that index, we try to not use validate because we don't feel like it's to say a, 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 a model. But one, one approach that we're probably going to have to use is use of, use of models. Uh, Apex, Apple, TBET, they're all different acronyms that some of you are probably familiar with. Peter Vargas is going to uh, talk, I'm sure, about Apple uh, after the break. But they're all excellent tools that, if properly out, um, locally calibrated, might provide us with some evidence to calibrate against that index. Again, the problem is, you know, we've got to make sure that these models are appropriate and our modeling that the losses from where you are, and you know, that because they both agree, they could be both wrong, but they could still agree. Um, and so, one of the tools, I think John, John Laurie's here, he's um, um, spearheading an effort that in, in, a lot of these models are now very readily available. What if somebody picks one off the shelf and starts using it without much calibration? How much calibration is used? Because we really realize a lot of states, some states have more resources and effort and energy of the people in there to, to revise and assess these indices uh, than others. And so what happens if you're using a non-calibrated model? And so part of the effort that's going to be going on over the next couple of years is going to be looking at that. And I think another key is going to be, at some stage, we've got to define or come to some agreement to find either the conditions rather than the amount of those conditions that lead to an unacceptable loss of phosphorus. We've got to set those bars or those limits, otherwise we're just still uh, talking about the general um, nuts and bolts. Um, I'll just quickly go through these. These are just some of the different BMPs that might be used from these tools. Um, quickly, our um, farm gate basically are what we think of as a solution because you're bringing less phosphorus onto the farm. Once she gets on there, source management and transport are, are basically band-aid, but if we can minimize what's coming on, either with uh, treating the manure, phytase, um, or sit lock, solid liquid separation, struvite is now coming to more of the front, in, especially in Europe, of extracting that phosphorus back out of the manure in a more concentrated forms. Um, we, we, we heard yesterday about um, an NIP and I and uh, others have been promoting the four R's and the stewardship, which is common sense, basically. Um, and um, most, a lot of states now, we require um, soil testing, but we also require manure testing. And also now, because fertilizer has gone up, manure is a bit more of a commodity, it's moving around, so farms are buying it based on their nutrient content. And so we do require, um, at least in our state, a, a nutrient content of that manure before it's land applied. Um, and we base also that on soluble phosphorus in the manure because they're not all the same and that has a greater potential for loss in runoff. And so we, we gear our applications to the soil. But getting that into the soil, um, again, credits, it all builds up the idea that there are several BMPs that, that, we, that we know are out there that um, these tools for management should address uh, and, uh, and consider. And so we come up with this, um, the, these numbers uh, of reduction credit that we've used in several indices. And again, it depends on state consensus, but we assign a percentage. These tend to be fairly conservative. 
um, in, in number, but you know, we can come up with some. Uh, NRCS have tried to do this by best judgment. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay have done a, a probably a more concerted effort of trying to put some science behind these numbers, um, but it, it can be done. I'm going to put past through that. But I want to just kind of end with this cautionary tale that some of you might be familiar with, and I was on from what I was saying in the uh, late theory, the great improvements, uh, and then there's been some more recent declines, and what was done in the 70s, uh, mutual planning and tools, these tools we talked about, you know, probably one was soil fertility, um, soil testing, uh, led to a great reduction in fertilizer application, and it also led to a, a great reduction in uh, manure applications, and so what that translated to from these watersheds that they Baker and Peter Richards at Heidelberg had been monitoring and published uh, was a decrease, as a, and, and things started to improve. Um, and the same with uh, dissolved phosphorus. But what has happened um, over the last few years is it started to creep back up again. And we kind of heard it yesterday that although they might reduce the total losses, what's coming off tends to be uh, more soluble. We might have um, a half, 50% uh, lower uh, total loss, but it may be 90% of that might be soluble. And so that tends to be immediately available, and therefore the, the problem's not going away. Um, and so really what has happened here was that when John Deere came out with their no-till, green-till planter, every, a, a lot of farmers went to no-till. And you went from a situation back in the 80s to very little no-till to everybody, to the majority of farmers using no-till. And what we again have learned is the management changed, but the tools for pea management didn't really change with it. Our recommendations for fertilizer and manure management and tillage, I think, remain the same from conventional as they did as we transition into conservation. And we know um, that the phosphorus builds up at the surface of the soil if it's not incorporated. And so it doesn't take a, a, a really a PhD to, to figure out that if you're not incorporating it, you're going to start to get more coming off uh, in a dissolved form. But again, I'm going to mention this partly in the fact of tools of management, that there's some sort of common sense applied, because um, when you talk to Pete Richards and, and Dave Baker, these were the recommendations that were basically came up with. You need to incorporate when you're on fertilizer. That, 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 that's again a no-brainer. Really, try and get it into the surface if you can. Um, put it on in, in, in the spring. Don't fall apply because it's sitting there on fallow ground um, so you can put cover crops on. Um, and so these are the recommendations. And when they, when, when they came out with those, what happened was the reality actually is what, what the, when we heard it yesterday, when we heard the farmers, we've got these tools, but sometimes we miss, <coughs> miss that quote of it being practical and well, it, it just falls down through the cracks into a certain extent. Um, farming, as most of you, the, the work is very time intensive. There's a lot of things that have to be done, especially in the spring. And they maybe have one, two days of window to, to either till, to um, um, apply pesticides, herbicides, to plant. There's a, a strip. Now, if you don't have a couple of days window there to which to apply that fertilizer, you're, you're lost. You're shot. And so, you know, if you were a farmer, um, you know, wanting to minimize your risk, you apply it, make sure you got it on in the fall if you get an opportunity. It, the fertilizer actually usually costs, costs less in the fall than it does in the spring, so you buy it in the fall like we would go to the supermarket and buy food. So there are all these other drivers out there, once we get this research and these tools, that um, make some of the tools we, we develop um, less effective. Um, another one was soil compaction. The, the consultants came back and said, it's better if we put it on a frozen ground because if it's wet and we have to get it out there, we're going to rub the soil, it's going to damage the soil surface, we're going to lead to more erosion, you're going to lead to more nutrient loss. And so, it, I guess the point here, it, it ain't simple and there isn't no one solution <coughs> and hopefully our tools will be able to address this just this cautionary note here, this tale um, of there being these other things that are out there operating um, and that we, can, we don't lose sight of 
the reality of what farming is doing than when we're using and developing our tools. And so to conclude, um, I think we, we all realize these tools need to be needed to be validated if you want to cause it, call it that, or assessed, or uh, compared with field runoff or model data. Um, they, um, the revision of the 590 or the indexes need to define a point above which uh, no one can apply. There, there was a lot of, several of those states didn't do that. And th that was no fault of theirs. They, there wasn't an incentive or there wasn't a uh, it wasn't on their radar when they did it. I had a call from a guy in one of the states asking if there's some information to help develop his index. And I said, when do you need the information? Well, I've got to do it this week. They were kind of basically given it a week, or he had allowed himself a week to develop the index for that state. And so it, it was just a priority for a different state. And that's not criticizing that state. It just wasn't that priority at that time. And things have changed. But we need to define a point of which, above which a no P can be applied, and that's, that's one of the revisions that are going through. Um, I think this revision will allow us to look at where, there's, where there are inadequacies, how we can address them, and to get some equivalency across state lines. We had the same problem with soil testing farmers only a few miles away in different states, come up with different recommendations. It doesn't improve our probably limited credibility to start with when they see that. Um, and that's going to be a challenge. And then this other idea of quantitative and predictive, and I'm just kind of going to kind of end there and leave that hanging maybe for that to break as to. Uh, <coughs> obviously, I'm a supporter of well, qualitative, get it right. Um, that's, that's, but I'm not saying that quantitative aren't, don't have. Um, some benefits in, you know, in terms of it being quantitative, it does allow you to assess a state to say, yes, it's working or not working. Um, and so, you know, we've got to somehow decide um, there are some pitfalls in having it quantitative and you have a number, that's then easily to say that's a, a loss limit. And then we start to transition into using these tools, which are kind of extension tools for, 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 for farmer management of phosphorus to becoming a, a model of predicting very small amounts of phosphorus coming off. And we're kind of sliding into this comfort zone and I'm not sure whether we, we really need to be, and I'm not saying that quantitative models can't, but we probably need to be thinking about whether we do need separate tools and that one tool for phosphorus management isn't going to do everything that we think we need to be doing. And so with that, I will stop and allow you time to get some coffee. Um, is there any questions? We do have time for... Uh,